our speaker. Today we are pleased to have Dr. Casado Perez with us. Um, Javier uh, F. Casado Perez, PhD, LPC, NCC, serves as an assistant professor of counselor education, the director of the Community Counseling Clinic, and coordinator of the Marriage, Couples, and Family Counseling Program at Portland State University. They earned their Doctor of Philosophy in Counselor Education and Supervision from the Pennsylvania State University with a doctoral specialty in teaching and higher education. They received their Master of Science in Mental Health Counseling from Monmouth University with a specialty in Relationship and Family Counseling. Dr. Casado Perez focuses their scholarship on equity and justice in higher education with special emphasis on faculty diversification and minority, minoritized faculty life, child welfare systems and family socio-emotional health mental health justice and social activism, and teaching and learning in counselor education and supervision. So with that, I'm very excited to welcome them and learn from them here today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Casado Perez and I will pass the, uh, the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Gretchen. Um, it actually makes so much sense now why your email came in at 4 a.m. in the morning, because you're in Jersey. <laughs> Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining. So I'm really excited to be here now and to walk us through the presentation and to talk a little bit about critical qualitative inquiry as well as the critical in-depth phenomenological interviewing. Um, CP, CP for short is what I you say because it's a really long name and it's I find it easier to say CP. Um, and to talk about some of its application. So, and before I get underway, a quick, a quick shout out to two of my students who are in the audience today, Sarah and Renata, if you can wave, hello. <laughs> um, so Sarah and Renata have actually been really instrumental in not only preparing this presentation, but they're both on the Minoritized Faculty Life Project, uh, and they've both been helping me with the everything, everything from your kind of ba basic scheduling and literature review all the way to interviews. Uh, data analysis and writing. So we're actually been writing a couple presentations together and papers together and that's sort of uh, another aspect of my own approach to critical qualitative inquiry is to involve students as much as participants in the process of inquiry. Um, so with that, I'll get underway. Just some quick uh, objectives for today. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to do some introductions to start just so we know who's here today with us. Um, everybody can hear me okay. I don't see any hands waving or okay. Then we'll move into some of my own social positioning in terms of who I am as a researcher, as an academic, as a, a professional counselor. I'll introduce, the, uh, I'll introduce and provide the principles to qual critical qualitative inquiry uh, and then as well as in-depth phenomenological interviewing which form CP. Uh, how they are implicated in, how is in-depth phenomenological interviewing implicated in critical qualitative inquiry, how we bring those together, uh, or how I have brought those together in the past, uh, essentially what makes CP, CP, and uh, applications of the methodology to the Minority Faculty Life Project, and I'm going to be pretty uh, detailed in that process, not overly detailed, but enough. I, oftentimes I've attended presentations on methodology where all the background like kind of surrounding points are made or around theory, conceptual framework, uh, research questions, but then nobody talks about how do I actually do it. So one of the things I told Gideon when we first were discussing the webinar was I, want, I really want to make sure that I cover how do you do this methodology in case any of you are curious in actually having uh, a methodology that you can apply that, isn't, that is timed, it's, a, it's, it's demanding on your time, but it's not impossible to do. Uh, and, and how does it integrate with critical qualitative inquiry. Then we'll talk about how I crafted the interview protocols for that project and the data analysis process itself. So that's sort of the orientation to, to the morning. Um, I know I only have 40 minutes, so I'm gonna try not to talk too fast. I already talk fast, um, so I'll try to slow down, but not slow down too much. And I'm aware that um, Christian, Dr. Christian Chan already covered some of the background theories of critical qualitative inquiry. I did sit down and watch um, his uh, webinar as well. So I'm, I'm, I kind of moved over some of the uh, basic theoretical information and sort of so we can just jump in. So no one feels like we're repeating, fingers crossed, no one feels like we're repeating the, the previous presentation again. Okay. Was there any, well, is there any kind of questions or areas that anyone would like to learn about uh, and make sure I cover? I know that that was mentioned in the beginning, but I want to make sure that um, I don't skip that. Okay. So if any questions or things you really want to know about come up during the webinar, please don't hesitate to, um, to wave or to 
unmute yourself. I moved the cameras over so I can see all of you now. Um, so if anybody's waving at me, I'll be able to see it. All right. So we'll start with introductions. Ooh. Um, I'm curious about who's in the room today, who showed up. Uh, so if you can introduce yourself, um, you can take a few, we'll take a couple minutes for the second part of this. Um, but if you can introduce yourself, the institution and program that you're at, and then pick one of the following, because we were not going to have time to talk about all three, um, but sort of answering one of these three questions around what motivated you to register for this conversation, or what experience do you have with critical methodologies, uh, or what does critical research mean to you? Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. My name is Annabelle, and uh, I am a doctoral candidate at the University of New Orleans. Can you all hear me well? Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of towards the end of finishing my dissertation project, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that I'll be defending this May. Um, my, my research, my dissertation research is on historical trauma. So it's, I'm very much, in terms of research interests, I'm very much interested in issues that kind of um, cut across social justice, um, intersectionality, all that. So I feel I don't know much about critical methodologies. So kind of I know what textbooks say. I'm, I'm not, I don't really know the application part. It's what's really interesting to me. So learning how to apply it. So that's kind of what motivated me to register um, for, this, uh, for, for these webinars. This is my second one, and hopefully I will be attending the third one. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Catherine Lee Esrush. I'm an assistant professor in San Diego State University in the School Counseling Program. And um, I attended the first one. And uh, I think my experience that I have with critical methodology has been more um, at the moment in studying and a little bit of an application. So my dissertation was a descriptive phenomenological investigation of um, cultural identity silencing of indigenous youth in education. Mm. So I, I have a, a lens and, a, and an interest in decolonizing frameworks and practices. Um, and so that's what, that's what my interest is, is in, in critical methodologies and specifically identifying as a phenomenological researcher. Um, I found this interesting. So that's why I'm here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, my name is Kalisha Jenkins. I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I'm also currently working on my dissertation, um, finally in the final stages um, within data collection, uh, yay me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so um, I'm using, utilizing phenomenological research, um, particularly within the community-based research practices, um, but also using some um, linguistic analysis to use some critical analysis for the data analysis pro process. Thank you very much. And congratulations to both of you who are in the final stages of your PhD. Sarah Renata, would you like to say anything? Um, I don't think I have too much to share, but um, <laughs> my name is Sarah Roundtree, um, and I'm at Portland State with Dr. Cresado Perez, um, and I'm a second year clinical rehabilitation counseling student. Um, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Renata Austin. Um, I'm a third year at Portland State um, and a graduate program in relationship and family counselor, marriage, couple, family counseling. Um, and my experience with um, critical methodologies that I just uh, started interviewing for the Minoritized Faculty Life Project. Thank you very much. You also, you also were there in the beginning when we first started planning it and organizing the IRB and all of that. So you've been with it for a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. I hope I can um, live up to your expectations and I can meet your needs in terms of kind of wanting to discuss phenomenology, critical phenomenology, critical qualitative inquiry and its application. Um, I am Javier Casado Perez, as I said earlier, uh, as my name. <laughs> I am uh, from Puerto Rico originally. I identify as mixed race, uh, brown for short is usually what I say. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I kind of presented myself and where I come from and who I am as a, a researcher and the position from which I 
see the world and from which I see my work and I see my, um, my approach to research. My exposure to uh, critical qualitative inquiry started in my doctoral program as, as well. Um, when I was trying to plan my, uh, preparing to present my dissertation, I have never been a traditional student. Uh, I come from a lower socioeconomic background. My family uh, lived in poverty in Puerto Rico. I went to, I, was, I had to go to public school because my parents could only afford one of my siblings to go to private school, which in Puerto Rico is the, you know, the, the, the better, oh, I just showed my plushie that I'm holding in my hands. <laughs> um, in Puerto Rico, the private, the private school is the one with the, you know, that quote unquote better um, curriculum. So I was, you know, through middle school and high school, not school prone. I didn't like school very much. I didn't quite fit in. Um, I experienced a lot of marginalization, minoritization, oppression, racist, racist commentary, um, uh, heteronormative commentary throughout my educational experience. So that kind of led into my graduate, my undergraduate work, uh, and that's a whole different webinar in terms of how I ended up being a PhD student because that was not planned, not what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and when I got to presenting my dissertation, I didn't, I didn't think I had paid enough attention to, uh, in my coursework, to identify methodologies that spoke, to identify uh, methodologies that were excellent, that were, you know, rigorous, that were, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of how I came across critical qualitative inquiry, which questioned what it means to um, non-traditional, not, uh, uh, minoritized researchers and populations, what it means to be a researcher and to do inquiry and to um, find out the experience and, and tap into the understanding and the lived experience uh, of minoritized communities. So the methodology, the, the philosophy of it really spoke to me. Um, I found it to be more accessible in terms of my own background and, and its language and how it approaches and views the world. So it's really why I leaned into it. I know Dr. Chan talked a little bit about how there's something wrong with doing me research. So I'm very proud of the fact that the work that I try to do is related to my own experiences um, during my doctoral program uh, and now after my doctoral program and teaching in the classroom and outside the classroom uh, in terms of the Minority Faculty Life Project. So that's sort of who I am. Uh, one of my kind of biases that I was laughing about when I first started creating the webinar is that I was trained at Penn State University, um, which was, that's where I did my doctorate. It's a very research focused institution. So I have this very, very, um, uh, very apparent con internal conflict between the critical qualitative inquiry, the philosophy and principles of critical qualitative inquiry and the training that I received at Penn State. Um, so I, I, I want to make that apparent that I do see myself as a rigorous, research-minded um, academic and also this internal experience of I want to make this more accessible. I want to make, I, I want, I, I hope and I work to do inquiry that has an impact that positively affects the lives of participants, uh, that positively, effect, positively affects the lives of students involved uh, the, and can transform and help change the academic context for minoritized, um, minoritized faculty, which is sort of where I focus a lot of my work, given my own experience as a minoritized um, counselor educator. So let's jump right in. Um, an introduction to critical qualitative inquiry. Um, so first, I kind of want to just sort of introduce the print, uh, the, the background or the philosophical overlook at critical qualitative inquiry, uh, CQI for short. CQI is an inter interdisciplinary and method methodologically versatile paradigm. And what that means is it's not, um, it's not based in one discipline. It doesn't come from one sort of um, basis of understanding for what uh, methods are and what, what research is and what inquiry is. And it's also meant to be a methodology that can be a methodological paradigm that can be adapted to how it's being applied. So something you find a lot in the literature around critical qualitative inquiry is a really diverse number of ways that the methodology or the paradigm has been applied. Uh, everything from uh, narrative studies to um, in-depth phenomenological interviewing to grounded theory, critical grounded theory. Um, so the critical qualitative paradigm isn't itself one methodology, 
It's more of a methodological paradigm. How do I apply my research? How do I think about um, the work that I'm, the research that I'm designing, the research questions that I am um, crafting, the interviews that I'm preparing? How is it in relationship with the communities I would like to positively impact, that I would like to serve and be in service of, that I would like to transform with? Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a way to see research and the work that you're doing. CQI scholarship uh, exposes everyday oppression as the precursor to action and change. Uh, CQI is not uh, a neutral standpoint, so that's something to be really um, aware of, that as you integrate critical qualitative inquiry into your already existing methodologies and consider how do I, how do I make my um, you know, descriptive phenomenology, phenomenology critical, um, that you're, you are asking questions around oppression, liberation, uh, uh, privilege, discrimination, power, particularly power cuts across all critical qualitative inquiry methods, no matter how it's applied. It's a critique of power. Uh, and that's actually what we talk a little bit about on the next slide. It's grounded in critical social theory, feminist standpoint theory with Brenda Allen, Dorothy Smith, Black feminist thought and intersectionality, Patricia Hill Collins, Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, critical race theory with Derek Bell, Richard Delgado, Patricia Williams, Mary Matsuda, and critical race feminism with uh, Adrian Wing, Dalia Rodriguez, and Fua Bohene. Um, so it, it is kind of grounded in a critical social theories paradigm, and that's what inspires the approach as not a non-neutral approach. You don't do critical qualitative inquiry um, without, for example, a historical awareness. And I'll talk that I'll actually talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the minoritized faculty life project uh, because that's what, that was a big question that I got from my dissertation committee and from reviewers for um, publications around the neutrality of the methodology um, and, and well I'll talk about it when I get <laughs> to the minoritized faculty life project. Um, CQI focuses on emergent and connective themes of triumph, resourcefulness, and change making and not on the deficits of participants. So this is pretty um, common of a lot of critical uh, not just methodologies, but critical social theories and critical theories uh, is the focus on um, uh, change making, action, impact, as well as resourcefulness, strengths, uh, triumphs, um, as opposed to what's the, in, the internalized individualistic deficits or shortcomings of the population that we're working with, uh, of the population that we're doing research with. Uh, or the population that we're serving as, uh, as counselors. The principles of critical qualitative inquiry, uh, these are sort of pulled acro from across different uh, substantial research or seminal research uh, or um, publications around the principles of CQI. Ongoing contextuality and multiplicity in method and interpretation, so that's a wordy one. Basically, uh, in other words, what that means is uh, that it's a method and interpretations vary. How you look at the issue, uh, how, what you find in the phenomenon, how you understand the phenomenon, how you interpret um, the findings that you receive, the results, the narratives, there, there will never be just one way. A lot of that is responsive to your research question, a lot of that is responsive to your conceptual framework, and a lot of that is responsive to what your participants say is important to them. And that's really instrumental to critical in-depth phenomenological interviewing is that the participants must drive the profile construction. And I'll talk about that toward the end. Um, that if, we, if you craft the profiles without the participant, then it is, it, 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 you can call it in a traditional in-depth phenomenological interviewing, but even then it's a stretch because uh, Seidman talks about having the participants be a part of the profile construction, construction method which is uh, a really interesting overlap between in-depth phenomenological interviewing and critical qualitative inquiry uh, was that Seidman was already talking about how, does, how do we involve research participants in the, in the crafting of their own profiles. It's informed by past and present context, so it's anti-historicism, uh, so ahistoric, anti-ahistoricism, ahistoricism being the denial of history and current problems, issues, and understandings. Um, how do I understand the phenomenon that I'm studying uh, as it exists in front of me now, as opposed to as it exists in front of me now in context of the social political history of the setting that it's happening in. 
and that that cuts that really you'll see that cut through the method uh, in the pro the minoritas faculty life project is how do I understand um, the phenomenon in its past uh, and present context, not just the present context. Centers on minoritized voices and the problematizing of power. So not only the the uh, kind of the elevation of minoritized voices and the focus and the work with minoritized populations, but also that the critique of power is really central to uh, critical qualitative inquiry. How does that problem become a problem? How does a phenomenon come to exist how, or be experienced? How does a, a situation at, the, at the, you know, the setting that you're working in, how, does it, how is it entangled with and interacting with systems of power within that setting? Uh, investigation to make known sites of resistance, change in activism. So this kind of connects back to our overarching uh, framework of CQI, which is that no matter the methodology through which you apply it, you're looking into resistance, change, and activism. So whether it's a critical ground of theory, um, Lutz, et, et, Lutz et al., ooh, I don't remember the other authors, 2013, did a critical ground of theory with minority faculty. It was a really instrumental study to um, sort of the, the projects that we're working on now. And the critical grounded theory was uh, focused around what is, the, what is a theory of resistance, what is a theory of survival and thriving for minoritized, uh, minoritized educators. How, what were, what, what, how did they theorize the process of existing, surviving, and thriving within the academic context? And what they found was that there was a lot of um, theorizing around how do we survive, what are successful strategies for survival, um, for making it through to tenure, and uh, resistance was an area that needed to be further explored, and that's sort of where um, our, this project picked up. The method is responsive to setting, uh, not by the method is responsive to setting, not vice versa, and the limits of that setting. So something that Dr. Chan talked about was how when you do critical qualitative work, um, or when you do critical work, oftentimes the setting, the system, the institution that you're working with in can be really limiting. It can really um, present sort of barriers to how do we do this uh, collaboratively, responsively, particip participatorily with our, our participants or the community when the institution itself limits us. So critical qualitative inquiry really talks about how, how does the method that you use respond to the setting uh, and the limits of that setting. So for one of the, for the minoritized faculty life project, one of the challenges that we have is that we're doing work with minoritized educators across academia and that what we know from the research and the history of uh, looking into the experiences of minoritized faculty, those educators are often overly taxed, whether that's culturally or socially taxed, they are often dealing with a lot more challenges, barriers, and tax, taxations and pulls from their institutional context. So the, in, the interviews themselves have to respond to that, not force the participant to fit into the schedule for the interviews, but adjust the schedule for the interviews. And that's a conversation that we've had with participants quite a bit around um, how much time between interviews do, do we need and versus how much time between interviews do they need, do they need and how do we navigate that. So, and then finally, research is uh, as iterative and embedded. It's a continuous process back and forth uh, within the context that your participants work in. Um, it's not something where you remove and you're studying it from, the, um, from your, your standpoint and as an external uh, evaluator, but you're sort of involved with them in conversation and relationship with your participant over time, um, responsive to who they are, how they're experiencing their lives, and how they're encountering challenges. Uh, within the context that they're in and navigating those challenges successfully, change making, transforming, which is of course, as we talked about earlier, one of the big pieces of critical qualitative inquiries that we focus on um, successes, triumphs, and change making. So I really like this uh, quote from Canela and LinkedIn 2012, critical qualitative inquiry is any research that recognizes power that seeks in its analysis to plumb the archeology span of taken for granted perspectives to understand how unjust and oppressive social conditions came to be reified as historical givens. And within the context of our minoritized faculty life project, for us, that uh, analysis of archaeology of taking for granted perspectives is, is the nature of academia. Uh, academia is just the way it is in many ways. It is a struggle, it is individualistic, uh, it is every person out for themselves, it is, uh, 
say no to anything but research and what how do we critique the power inherent in those that are uh, taken for granted how do we critique how it uh, marginalizes and it maintains um, its social makeup within academia uh, the part the one part that really spoke to me that I wanted to make sure to share with everyone is that that the discussion of any research that recognizes power uh, and that it, it it critiques those taken for granted perspectives. And as you're thinking about critical qualitative inquiry, particularly how do you apply it to your own work and your own methodologies, that that becomes a central question. How does my work that I'm doing question, critique, and problematize power? If, you don't, if there's anything else to take from today, it's that, <laughs> which I guess would make it a much shorter webinar, um, but that when you're thinking about critical qualitative inquiry, it's, it's how, does, how does my work problematize and critique power? And if I, if I can't, if I don't know, I don't know how to answer that question in my, in my methodology that I'm using uh, or, in the, or in my analysis or in my presentation of findings and the discussion of findings, then that's where you start to lean in. So what, 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 what is the history of the setting that I am doing this inquiry in? What is the social political history, the structural history, and where does power reside within these institutions and how does that impact the population that I'm working with? And on behalf of. And to introduce uh, in-depth phenomenological interviewing, which created this, the sort of the applied um, component of the, the project that we did, it's a procedure that aims to capture a holistic representation of experience. Uh, it comes from the work of Irving Seidman. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with Irving Seidman's work and the, uh, the interviewing as um, qual whoop, I forgot what it's called. Well, I use it all the time. I don't remember the title of it. Interviewing as qualitative research. Interviewing as something. If anyone remembers that, you can say it for the webinar. Um, interviewing uh, procedure aims to capture a holistic representation of experience. It emphasizes participants' profiles over archaeological coding process. That's an important one. Uh, for the methodology, the limitations of um, production within the academic context and the, uh, liter li the, the context of the literature is that oftentimes we don't have the space to present profiles. Uh, we're given the space to break apart profiles and present uh, statements from a profile. And something that Seaman talks about is that that's, an, that's, that's a reality of the context that we work in, but that doesn't mean we can't speak to the spirit of the profile and find other ways to represent and to provide con the context of those profiles. And one way to do that through the critical qualitative um, perspective is then to, to really dive into those generative themes. What themes come up when we consider profiles next to, next to each other and in conversation with one another, as opposed to just taking one profile at a time and finding um, themes be within each one. In-depth phenomenological interviewing is designed to be facilitative of change uh, and transformation for participants. So the process itself, and we'll talk about in the next slide, the three interviews, the three interviews themselves are meant to provide a transformative experience or even a change-making experience for the participant. It is meant to serve the participant, which is one of the things that led me as a, as a practitioner scholar, practitioner coming first, um, to really lean into this methodology is that it speaks first to um, how, does, how does my research project serve the community that I'm working with? It's limited, uh, one of the limitations of the method is that, oh, oh, one of the limitations of the method is that it's time sense intense, intensive, uh, and that can kind of get in the way of, um, well, it can not get in the way, but that can pr provide a barrier to some of the participants becoming involved. It's a three part, so I'll skip forward to the next slide. It's a three-part interview process, and each interview is about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, not, of course, it's not doesn't have to be that way. It can be 45 minutes um, or, or less, depending on how much the participant wants to share, given the phenomenon that you're um, investigating. But each interview has its own focus, the life histories, the detailed experiences of the phenomenon, so life history being what led you to be blank, what led you to uh, become a nurse. Well, how did you end up becoming a nurse? What, what tell me your typical day as a nurse from waking up to going to bed, uh, as I think is actually the example that human uses. And then meaning making. What does it mean to you to be, be a nurse? What does it mean to you to have these experiences um, in each of your days? 
and that's sort of how, what transforms when you look at it through a critical qualitative inquiry uh, perspective. So I'm getting, getting messages here from our, I think it's our facilitators telling me that I'm running out of time. No? What's happening nope. in there? Actually, Renata just uh, shared the name of the book. Um, so oh, Jenny was speaking before, so it's all good. Not yet. <laughs> Sorry, I, my computer keeps alarming me. It's just like, it's just this thing pops up my screen. I'm like, why? Why is that happening? <laughs> okay, sorry. Every time I click on it, though, we go to the next slide. So I can't even check what's happening in the box. <laughs> All righty. Um, so then let me slow myself down. So I was, I was say, uh oh, I'm running out of time. So why don't we, so let's jump into the method itself. So critical in-depth phenomenology, phenomenological interviewing, and what makes CPCP. So one of the things that, um, as I mentioned before, the, the aspects that I really appreciated about in-depth phenomenological interviewing was the way that it was designed to be uh, facilitative, to be for, um, uh, helpful and beneficial to the participant themselves, that the method serves the participant rather than the participant serving the method, that if they, each interview is responsive to the time limitations uh, of the participant, that while we aim to have a week in between each interview, we can do it in as little as 24 hours for you in each interview. There isn't one way that you must do this because the final product, and this is what we tell participants, the final product, the aim of the investigation is the profile, not some co not like um, answering one particular question that we really have, but it's capturing their, their profiled experience and letting that speak on behalf of the participant. Now, when it comes to conference presentations and article, publications, then we get into a dialogue around how do I uh, represent the profile accurately without breaking it apart um, and sort of separating, uh, separating it. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. So critical and phenomenolog phenomenological interviewing integrates the emphasis on the holistic experience of the profiles that's inherent in, in IPI with the, with the focus on minoritized voices and the problematizing of power in CQI, that while we, we know that our investigation aims to profile the experience of minoritized faculty living in academia, living and thriving and surviving academia in a holistic way through these profiles, and we also recognize that in our attentive to that part of that work is to problematize and critique the power inherent in uh, the academic context, given the social political history and the geographic history of uh, higher education institutions within the United States. It also implicates critical phenomenology, which is a third um, methodological paradigm that I, we, that, that I pulled into the work while I was uh, designing CP and, and trying to create a, an, an application to CQI uh, that would be holistic and profile, profile the participants. And critical phenomenology understands that the experience, that experience can only be understood in the context, uh, in the context with which, within which it's happening and historically. So we, if I want to understand the experiences of, my, uh, of minoritized faculty, then that can only be understood in the, con the social political context of higher education and the, the, his the holistic history of that context. The, and a commitment to keeping research uh, procedures in conversation with the researcher so that we as researchers are part of our work, we're part of the experience of participants, we impact that experience, we can't, it's impossible to go in and interview a participant and not be impacting them is one of the core tenets of not only critical phenomenology, but also critical qualitative inquiry, that we're part of that process and also in that phenomenological interview, we're also part of that process of interviewing. And, and, uh, and understandings emergent therefrom are kept in the social political historical context, which I've already talked um, a little bit about. And CP focuses on generative and connective themes uh, between profiles over categories and codes. So one of the pieces that you'll find in a lot of my work um, is this, this ongoing conversation around how we, what we presented here, whether it's in a conference presentation or a, research or a paper, pub a published paper, what I'm presenting here are generative themes from profiles being in conversation with one another. That the, 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 the profiles of the participants um, are not they're not they're not themselves then analyzed and broken down into categories and codes but what are the emergent themes the the generative themes that arise when you consider that these profiles are existing in an academic context uh, and what's happening between the experiences of these two participants um, what's emerging in 
in that contact. So I'm going to, uh, how are we on time actually, Gretchen? We're doing good. We have about probably about 18 minutes before I would ask you to transition. So feel free to take as much time of that as that you need. So then, with that, um, I will then we'll be, I, I will I'll be, I will stop at the activity. Whoa, sorry, <laughs> I will stop here at the activity for a moment and give us a chance to um, process, to to kind of think through what we've been listening to, and to apply a little bit of this lens around critical in-depth phenomenology. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes, and not everybody has to share what they what they write down, what they type down. Um, but find yourself a space to write and reflect uh, on, on this sort of uh, methodological process, but particularly on your own interest in implementing and integrating critical qualitative or quantitative research, uh, how, that you, you know that you're motivated and you're interested in doing this. So what we're gonna do is focus on what, what's motivating that interest and how is the institutional context that you're in supportive or limiting of that interest. And we'll sort of reflect on that, 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 not so much the historical context, we may not all know the history of our institutions or where we're at, but sort of the, the institutional context, uh, the social political context of your institution and how it nurtures or challenges that interest in becoming and integrating a critical, a critical researcher identity. And we'll take just about maybe three, three or four minutes for that. Um, and then a couple of people can share what they came up with. All right, so what did, what did we come up with? Um, one of the things, especially within this dissertation process that I'm learning, um, which I wish I didn't have to learn in my dissertation, was when you're utilizing um, critical um, principles and applying things that are very multiculturally sensitive, it can be quite limiting, particularly within um, certain institutions, or at least being at a, a institution that is um, research intensive, that already has practices and standards, um, mm -hmm. and how to navigate that system um, in which I can do what I can do so I can graduate, but also do what I feel like is near and dear as a researcher that, that does look at the power structures um, and how to, um, to magnify that in a way that is conducive to the next generation for people that are more, um, that needs that multiculturally sensitive work. Mm. Um, and so it's been, it's been a juggle, um, but it's definitely like a, a, a great learning process and a learning curve of what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something that's interesting that, that stands out to me there is that tension, the, you know, the tension between your own, um, the, the rigorous training that you're receiving in a research intensive institution, and how that's in tension with the historically established um, ideologies around what research is and uh, the objectivity of research, the, the kind of absoluteness of truth uh, in a lot of top research institutions, that the most productive and the most uh, prolific are those that really lean into that positivistic uh, view of research and that tension that now you are building resourcefulness around is how do I navigate that? I know I have becoming aware of the power structure and who defines what research is for me and then also how do I now through, a pro through this interaction learn to successfully navigate that and to do the work that matters to me while also negotiating with this kind of system of power. Thank you very much. Anybody else? So um, I'm fortunate to be in an institution that has uh, quite a few faculty that are um, have a unique scholarship. And so the department itself is really nurturing. And um, I also had the privilege of having a dissertation committee that was supportive of my, my question of inquiry and allowed me to have committee members who were from other areas and disciplines. So I had a critical race scholar that was on my dissertation committee. I had um, as someone who was, uh, you know, had expertise in um, discourse analysis. And so even though I was doing something that was descriptive, um, I was able to have, you know, people on the committee that uh, had diverse perspectives. And again, were really um, examining my research from uh, a standpoint of how well can I explain it and um, actually describe a methodology more so than 
thinking about it in the context of, um, you know, as a quantitative or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how many people do you have involved? Um, things like that. So, um, so I had that privilege and I have that privilege now being at this institution. I think the struggle now is, um, you know, again, you know, that, that struggle that we speak of, I think is, is really how do we navigate within worlds? And um, I found that language always helps. And so in looking at RTP and, and tenure process, um, how am I going to strategize my projects so that when I need to speak to them, um, I, I have the language to do so, um, mm -hmm. to explain how it was rigorous and impactful. And I think that's the, I think that's the key, um, is really ha helping each other find that language more so than um, saying that we need to create something brand new because it's there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that, and that's the, so finding that having that community to launch to have to be surrounded by people who are not measuring your 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 inquiry uh, by the stand by their own standards of research that are not even related to yours, which is often can often be the experience of critical um, scholars during their doctoral program is that the people they, in their committee may not just not have that experience in that research and you having that and having being able to be launched and I, uh, from that more supportive context. And then I'm also considering PNT, uh, promotion and tenure, and how are you gonna navigate that new, or that, that next world, right? And how are you going to be in conversation with, how are they gonna measure my research? And how are they gonna measure my scholarship? And speaking to, and, and if I'm hearing you correctly, speaking to it in a way that I'm proud of, that, I, that I, this, is, this is work, and this is rigorous work, and I can describe it to you and you in a way that you will understand what I'm saying, <laughs> because that's how I know the work that I'm doing. One more person want to share? Can jump in as well. Yeah. Um, I think as well it depends on the focus of your research. I'm currently involved in a in a site project, and it's about the implicit um, privileges in the training model of counselor education programs. I mean, for people from from um, across different socioeconomic economic statuses, and because the focus of the research in looking at the training model, it can come across as you're working with faculty, it can come across that you kind of am trying to criticize the program. So how do you, in a way, navigate that, that, um, that aspect of trying to do your research? But at the same time, yes, you're criticizing the structure, but um, doing it in a way that, um, that it, helps, it helps the program to grow, but at the same time, without breaking down those, those relationships that are important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a that's such an important question. We, it's you know, how do you communicate that I'm critiquing I'm critiquing a structure and a system, not an individual? Right? How do I how do I do this work in a way that critiques power when the people that hold power may take it personally, <laughs> and they may be colleagues and people that we know, uh, and sometimes they can be friends. And, how, and separating that the the historic that the the historic the social political history of an institution is not the social political history of that individual. Uh, you are working within a system that has existed and will continue to exist, and that's what I'm critiquing that that larger system. And that actually that's a great segue for the Minority and Faculty Life Project. Um, so because that was one of the big questions for us in in um, in two ways. One was as I participate, if you know the the question of critiquing an institution uh, on my dissertation committee, I had the associate vice president of my university, which was a really interesting experience um, because she was she was an incredible teacher, and I really I had learned an incredible amount from her. And then she moved it she moved into this leadership position that uh, was afforded a lot of power, and a lot of my dissertation was around critiquing that that those systems institutions of power. Um, and we had to navigate. We had to navigate that question, and then also the question of my participants who were being vulnerable and sharing aspects of their experience and of their life that they were concerned the systems of power would then retaliate for. And how do you navigate that question? And that's a that's actually something that's come up frequently in this work with minoritized uh, educators. Is who? How do you find participants when becoming if you're identified, there is real consequences to your participation. And also, how do you navigate that when you really want to do something that creates change and transformation 
in the educational context. So we've, the, the project has spanned two iterations, the first one being a dissertation project and the kind of following processes after that. And now we're currently in the middle of our second iteration um, with Renata and Sarah being part of the research team. We uh, have recruited now 12, 12 or 13 participants and I think we're bringing that, we're holding at that number. Come, I'm bringing that together with our previous iteration. It is framed within a critical race feminist uh, theoretical perspective, uh, elevating the voices of minoritized educators, emphasizing transformative storytelling, how they have successfully navigated the academic context and leading up to tenure. And some of our participants currently are have just passed tenure. So they have that, that's transformative storytelling in terms of success and triumph rather than deficits, shortcomings and failure and centering on resistance, adaptation, and subversion, particularly. How do I, as Kalisha, you pointed out, how do I navigate a context that I already know isn't really designed for me in a way that subverts it, that introduces new information, that introduces new methodologies in a manner that's not to say that I'm critiquing you, Annabelle, as you're pointing out, right? I'm not critiquing you. I'm introducing something new, uh, uh, something m more, and, and a kind of a, a, a broader way to think about phenomena and think about issues. The overarching question for the project is how do minoritized faculty transform the academic landscape through everyday resistance and survival? Uh, it's, it's a basic and profound question at the same time. Uh, how do I, in my everyday actions, change the academic institution? Through the little things I do, uh, through intera interpersonal interactions, classroom activities, uh, in the hallway moments, rather than larger organizing resistance, um, uh, which is kind of larger movements, demonstrations, uh, policy, faculty senate. These are, so they, we focus more on those everyday moments of resistance that help to change the climate, culture, uh, system of uh, your department and your institution. The methodology we've been talking about for this whole time, so <laughs> I'm gonna move right past that one. And there are two branches to the project. One is a qualitative, critical qualitative branch uh, around minority faculty experiences, resisting institutional oppression and assimilation. And there's a critical qu uh, quantitative branch, which uh, is looking at the effects of subtle discrimination on productivity, wellness, and life satisfaction around my, uh, among minoritized um, educators and bringing those two together to um, understand how they then respond to those, th those experiences of subtle discrimination. So bringing it, all, bringing it all around to what we actually have done and, and how we've kind of integrated critical qualitative inquiry into our methodology, uh, we took the historical context of higher education uh, and, and institutional research uh, to sidestep fears of uh, demands for justification. So this is essentially going back to what Katie and Annabelle were already talking about, that when the question arises of how is this research, uh, and how do you know that minoritized educators are going up, are, are coming up? I was actually just um, looking through Richard Hill Collins's intersectionality, and it starts it starts off with the arg the the argument for intersectionality is over, and I really like that. That's kind of how it starts because that's sort of how I approach that question. Is the research has been there since the 80s that minoritized educators are experiencing challenges and barriers to success and thriving in academia. That it's not a new question, it's not never been researched, it's not um, you know, little understood, the research isn't scarce, uh, you know, those things that we often say when we're trying to write about something that we haven't, that there's an intellectual, a knowledge gap, right? A knowledge gap or a, um, a need in the literature. This, this, that particular question isn't one of them. And that's sort of one way that we, did, we have sidestep demands for justification is with a long list of citations around um, the history of, of the challenges and barriers states what I could eat by, by um, minoritized academics. Now, what there isn't a lot of understanding around is the experiences of um, particular subgroups of minoritized academics. For example, the queer, uh, queer educators, ed educators with disability, indigenous educators, a lot of that experience has not quite been looked at specifically within that population. And one of the big challenges around that research is, which I find, uh, this kind of problem that I really want to wrestle with is that how do you become involved in a project that if I become involved, I will be identified? Because in my whole institution in the Midwest, there's only one of me. 
right? So how, like, or people know who I am because I'm very well known and kind of out there uh, or visible. So we wanted to invite participants to self-identify as change agents and anti-oppressive advocates in their institution because we know that this is a long-standing issue. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a long-standing issue and there has been research on survival strategies. There has been research on um, with, with counselor educators who successfully or educators who successfully made a tenure we wanted to kind of start from that base of, okay, this is a critical qualitative inquiry. We're using critical in the phenomenology to understand the profiles of participants who are change, who self-identify as change agents. I am willing to say something. I am willing to do something when I see it and to speak out uh, and, not, and, and start from that, that non-neutral place. Because we know that the research tells us that this is happening. And the interview process needed to balance uh, the historical context of the previous research with researcher involvement that we talked about earlier that I become a participant observer. I'm in a relationship with my participants. I was talking to a participant um, just yesterday and in our conversation, one of the things that came up between us was that a lot of their, um, a lot of their resistance strategies and their, their, act, their uh, action was Preemptive. It was a form of preemptive resistance for them, that they've created a, a context and an environment within their classroom and their department where oppression was less likely to happen because they were very visible and apparent about what their work was and the work that they had done and the research that they were doing around how students respond um, to people who look like them. So that we, and that was in conversation together. So that it's not, I'm completely, I, I don't need to be completely quiet because I'm a removed researcher. I mean, I'm, in, I'm in this conversation with you. And the participants organic process in shaping a holistic representation. So holisticness here being what they define. What do they define as important to include? What do the participants define as um, an essential aspect of their profile over me being the one that decides what will be most important or not, which is the next slide. Um, I, didn't, I had intended to share the protocol with all of you for the interviews, I actually have it right here, but uh, I am not tech savvy, so I don't, I'm gonna send it to Gideon and Gretchen and hopefully they can kind of provide it, uh, send it forward to you, because we do wanna share, I wanna share some of the profiles that we constructed in the previous iteration of the study, and I also wanna share with the participants permission, of course, and I also wanna share the interview protocol um, that we used. So what did this, how did this transform then from the interview itself, or how does it go from planning and uh, crafting an interview protocol to performing the interview and then data analysis? Uh, so each interview focused around one, large, one larger research question, what led participants to becoming faculty willing to resist institutional forms of oppression and assimilation? That's research question one, which directly responds to Seidman's sort of the history, the life history of the issue. Research question two, what do these experiences of resistance look like in detail? Again, the, the in detail experience of our interview two, uh, here particularly around those moments where in the hallway, someone gives you a look or it makes a comment and you stop them and talk to them about uh, where that came from or a student in a classroom, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of communicates a microaggression and you stop the class to discuss how implicit bias kind of surrounds, revolves around that, or in an email, or with a, fa with a colleague, or in a faculty meeting. So those are those in-detail experiences. What did you say? What did they say? Walk, walk us together through what happened. And then the final one is the meaning-making around resistance and speaking out. Given the meaning-making from the interviews themselves, what, what sense have these interviews made to you, is one of the questions that we ask as you're pulling them together. And then also, what are, what are your resistance uh, what do your actions of resistance and speaking out in advocacy for yourself mean for your future trajectory as, a, as an educator? Uh, what does resistance mean to you? It becomes part of that, that third interview. And then finally, member checking. So once those are transcribed, what we did is we had members, not, we did a two-part member participation, participant process, one being that the members check the transcripts to make sure that they're accurate. And a lot of this followed, um, the standards of accuracy that Seaman provides, as well as some of uh, Maxwell's kind of um, 
ensuring trustworthiness and validity of the, of the project. So they check transcripts to make sure that they are accurate to what, how they would like their uh, data represented. Then they are reduced following Seedman's process. Now Seedman, if Seedman's process is a little different than kind of um, the standard uh, quote, quote, well, there's a lot of ways to analyze qualitative data, so I'm not even gonna say that. The Seedman reduction process is really responsive to the research questions. So as you go through, it's identifying significant statements that are responsive to the research question that guided that interview to begin with. Now the interview protocol is uh, the larger question and then kind of sub questions under that. So it's a semi-structured interview. And what we do is as once we the transcriptions are, are finished and checked, then we go through and identify statements that are really salient to those research questions that guided each part of the interview. And then we go through a second time and identify the ones that want to be kept, we, we, we feel are second round pressing to be kept for the profile. And then a final round is done with another, with the other person reviewing that transcript. So together we decide what are the statements that have to stay in this profile. And then that's not really where we stop. Then we craft a profile uh, and we share that with the member so the, or the participant. So the participant has a chance to read through the profile that we've crafted. And now they can say, well, I actually really want to include this story or I actually really want to take this story out. So the first iteration of the project, there was a participant who had shared a really kind of profound experience of um, overt racism in their institutional context, but they, they, didn't, they, couldn't, they didn't want to leave that one in. They felt it was too identifiable, um, and although they felt it was important, they really wanted to just take that out, and we did. And part of some participants changed their location, changed their um, identifiers, they change the region that they're in or the institution that they're in. And what we kind of talk to participants about is that really that's not the point of the inquiry. The point of the inquiry is the profile. And this speaks back to our very first slides around critical qualitative inquiry. It's not about this like, no, we have to do it this way. We have to represent your information this way. The profiles have to be provided this way. It's about what would you like to contribute to our understanding through this profile. And if that means changing the geographic location that you're in, then we change the geographic location that you're in. That's not, that's not the point of critical qualitative inquiry. So the standards of accuracy there at the bottom are the profiles that the profiles, we do follow the profile being constructed in the order of the interview. So interview part, you know, the first interview, second interview, third interview, turn into the first part, second part, and third part of the profile. Um, each part, occurs in order of the conversation. So we don't break apart the, the transcript to kind of put things where we want them in the profile. Uh, and the whole construction process involves the participants throughout. We also do repeat meetings with the research team for bracketing and awareness of our own biases and our own kind of identities and identity politics and interactions with our participants. And we memo across the entire investigation to make sure that we're accounting for our reactions to the stories that we're being told and, and how are we allowing them or not allowing them to interact with the interview that we're conducting. Um, so each research member, uh, team member has their own kind of memo book that they respond to that, write questions around uh, on that for. Um, so also to, to close, my hope for the webinar is that you've seen how we've integrated critical qualitative inquiry principles with an existing in-depth phenomenological interviewing procedure that really guides and it can really guide an investigation in terms of interviewing and process and procedural process, but we've overlaid the critical qualitative inquiry principles onto that to um, not recreate the wheel, as Katie pointed out, but to merge critical qualitative inquiry and in-depth phenomenological in, uh, interviewing into CP and that we start from a place of power exists in academia, it's afforded to certain parts of academia, and as a minoritized educator, you're in a constant process of navigating, sometimes successfully, sometimes with, with setbacks, but a, a process of constantly navigating. And these profiles are meant to capture that process. How do you change, create change? How do you transform the academic context? How do you push back against messages that say that you don't belong there? that the only way to belong there is by presenting yourself in one way. Uh, and that's the, that's the emphasis of our interviews and the purpose and then the, the process of data analysis to create profiles that really speak to that. Once the profiles are complete, we share them with all of our participants, which is something that we have, I have been really proud of been able to do 
is a particip participant's gave permission to share their profile with all the other participants. So that way, if we have 12 participants, all 12 deltas get to see all 12. And then it becomes a really therapeutic and transformative process for them that, oh, these are like 11 other people dealing with, with all of this. So, so that's, my, that's my time. That's actually my time plus 11 minutes. <laughs> It's all good. We're, we'll forgive you on that. Um, but thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, and with that, I'd like to open it up to the group for comments, questions, or any thoughts you might have about how you will integrate some of the insights offered by Dr. Casada Perez. Um, and with that, I would like to kind of facilitate a group discussion and kind of uh, leave the floor to you all to kind of share what your thoughts are. I guess I'll go. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, for the for presenting the webinar and um, being with us this morning. So I um, so my questions thinking about more of the the methodology is is existing as a new paradigm. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with how uh, critical um, qualitative inquiry, critical inquiry, is a new paradigm because what you're speaking to really sounds like hermeneutic phenomenology, and so. And it sounds like just what what is good um, research, mm -hmm. and by really just examining what is good research, and I, I'm wondering if how is this how is this a new paradigm? So how is critical qualitative inquiry a new paradigm? Yes, yeah, so like what what makes it a new paradigm? Because what you're speaking to is spoken about in hermeneutic um, mm -hmm. phenomenology, it's spoken to in, in descriptive phenomenology. Mark Daigle, you know, speaks yeah. to it in, in postmodern phenomenology. Of, of really diving in and, and um, honing in on those questions and forming, like you said, you know, speaking of Seidman's phenomenological interview model, um, I'm just curious, like, how is this, how is this a new, a new paradigm? Yeah, so my, my response to that would probably, be, my response to that is that it is in a new paradigm. Um, critical qualitative inquiry does connect with some of the more traditional phenomenology and does connect with more traditional uh, not traditional, but kind of established methods. And it isn't that it wants to recreate a new paradigm for research. It wants to contribute a, the, a focus on minoritized voices, uh, voices that are uh, marginalized and oppressed, and, a, and essentially, most importantly, a critique of power, uh, a, a social political history, and so that it's really focused on listening to voices that, so that, that's where critical quality, when you think about critical quality of inquiry, can I still go back on here? So thinking about this quote around uh, any research that recognizes power and seeks to, to kind of um, problematize what we take for granted in the institution or, and in institutions is another area where it's really focused on the systems and structures of power and oppression and listening to voices of the minoritized specifically uh, from the context and the understanding of minoritization. So I don't, I don't think that it's trying, I, I mean, I guess I would venture ha ha hazard to say <laughs> that it's not trying to be a new paradigm, but to focus the focus attention on minoritized voices and the problematizing of power, partic particularly social political power, um, power that comes from identity and privilege uh, and oppression. So bringing in the language of critical social theories, uh, which we talked about a little bit earlier, feminist standpoint theory, critical race theory, uh, and how do those help inform what we're, what we're doing in our practice? So I don't, I guess that would be my, my response is that I think that you um, are, are speaking to a really important part of it is that it's not, not to consider critical qualitative inquiry as an, a new way to think about qualitative inquiry. It's that it's a focus on um, social political power and the, the critique and problematizing of oppression within the institution or the context that we're trying to investigate. Thank you for answering. Yeah. That. I guess the reason I asked was because I think some of the struggle um, for faculty um, who are interested in questions that specific, specifically focus on um, marginalized and historically oppressed communities is, is the sense that um, some of the barriers that arise within promoting that research or getting that research validated is, is the disconnect with some of these questions as to what distinguishes this as a, as a new paradigm. Um, because I think if we, if we have an understanding of where, you know, the traditional, um, mm -hmm. so to speak, 
uh, methodologies are, are rooted. It then helps us with the language. Um, so like my, my dissertation study exploring uh, experiences of education um, from indigenous uh, people. Um, yeah. My literature review included critical race theory, included um, indigenous critical theory as well as, as informing my approach, but the methodology itself was descriptive. Um, and then having an understanding of the descriptive phenomenology and using Seidman's phenomenological interview that allowed me to address questions as to why I made decisions like, um, you know, using Seidman's when descriptive is focused just on basically that second interview. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, why within my analysis did I decide to um, sidestep part of the process and not only form a structure of what the phenomenon looks like, but um, form individual narratives because that aligns with indigenous uh, ethics mm. and um, the relationship with the participant. And so it allowed me to, to say where the rigor was involved, how it um, still addressed and was phenomenological and descriptive phenomenology, uh, but then had addressed those questions that you, you raise with you know, that critical lens. And so that's why I think it's important to, to really, you know, for us as researchers, as we move on, um, really examine, you know, when we're saying it's a new paradigm and we're introducing it to folks as new, I think that's where we're hitting barriers. And by having an understanding of how research, you know, good research, like if we're doing good qualitative research, um, we're actually responding to many of these questions already um, can help us in defending our dissertation and, and promoting our work. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I would like to go um, because I, th I think it's fascinating having this discussion because I had to defend it in my proposal hearing the same questions um, as far as what what makes my research um, novel and innovative and you know the, the standard of why am I doing the research that I'm doing um, because I'm looking at the self awareness process within multicultural training and how we even talk about these things. Um, and so a lot of those questions that we're, we're bringing up, it, it was a lot of the questions that I had to defend within my dissertation um, proposal here. And, and that was one of my, my critiques was, this isn't new research. This isn't um, necessarily new things, or it's not really necessarily novel, particularly within my methodology. However, um, how am I applying it is something that is necessary for what I'm trying to find out and figure out as of right now. And I think mm -hmm. it, it has to do with a lot with how we apply the principles um, to, to do that transformative work. Um, because I see myself coming from a transformative paradigm that really highlights that social political and power um, within structures um, and to do it in a way that it, it, it promotes the, the things that is necessary because it, it, it can get very convoluted pretty quickly. Um, if we're not careful, particularly around the linguistics or how we are actually discussing the principles in the same way. Um, and so it, it does, it makes the whole challenge because it's, it's like, I don't see me doing anything new or novel. I see myself as exploring what's already there and trying to take it to a, a, a lens in which it promotes the messages that are, have already been there, but might have been silenced um, amongst mm -hmm. a lot of different um, groups. And so it's, it's, it's a challenge um, in, in that sense, because I do see, especially when we're talking about power and power structures and social political um, influences, there's a lot of groups that have been marginalized and silenced um, in those, um, um, in the, the way that we discuss things. And so I'm actually seeing that within my um, data collection is that we are, we, we have silenced a lot of things just by the way that we discuss principles. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is pretty important as well. Yeah, and, I, and one of the things that comes up for me is thinking about critical qualitative inquiry and how that, that concept of a new, a new paradigm or a new uh, way of thinking about research or a new, um, these new principles to apply or a new methodology to use and how problematic that would be and how uh, it would be really ahistoric to think that, like Felicia, you're saying that not seeing yourself as doing something new a lot of this, you know, a lot of this literature and as we know from the critical social theories have been around and they've been there for some time. So it's not that uh, applying a, a new um, paradigm to, to advertise it that way and to advocate for this is innovative, this is new, this is novel, 
um, because I'm being asked by someone in a position of power to argue that it's novel in some way is really to ignore the contributions and the work of critical scholars that have come before and have really presented this work um, and, and brought together uh, sort of a, a way of thinking about research that is really responsive to uh, the histories of oppression and marginalization, and minoritization um, in the context that we work in. All right. Um, with that, I guess I will say thank you to everyone again for joining us um, today, especially Dr. Casado Perez. Um, thank you for your presentation and um, thank you to everyone for coming out on a Saturday morning to uh, speak about qualitative research. Mm -hmm.